A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Philippians 4, chapter 4 through 6. Verse 4 through 6. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderations be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. I want to say many times we see and we hear things differently. A lot of times I could say things as a pastor or as a leader and you hear it, but you need some kind of incentive uh, to, to understand it. Uh, my goal today is not to get you to shout. My goal today is to teach you to survive. I want to give a quote and then I want to give a short video clip right after the quote uh, from Bear Grill, Grills, who is a survivalist. He comes on TV uh, if you've watched Discovery Channel or the History Channel, he comes on TV with this survival uh, mentality. I wanted to watch a short video shortly. Uh, it says, he says, survival is not about being fearless. It's about making the decision to stay alive long enough to see change. I'll give you a second to watch this. Woo! I'm Bear Grylls. I go to some of the most dangerous places on earth to show you what it takes to make it out alive. I've traveled the globe facing challenges in the sort of places you wouldn't last a day without the right survival skills. Now, I'm in British Columbia, high in the Rocky Mountains. I usually head out into the wild, but this week, using specialist equipment, we're gonna bring the wild to me so I can show you how to survive the most extreme environments. The team will give Mother Nature a helping hand to ensure conditions are as bad as they can get. We're going bigger, better, and more ambitious than ever before. I'll battle the bone-chilling waters of a frozen lake. You gotta keep eyes on me, okay? Before swimming 40 foot under solid ice. I'm wet, cold, I've gotta act fast. Blast a ridge line, set off a huge avalanche, then get buried alive to experience the suffocating conditions of the aftermath. Don't move, I can't breathe properly. I try to find shelter in the middle of a man-made blizzard before frostbite sets in. Up here you can have minus 40. In here it's gonna be way, way warmer. And careen down the icy mountain at over 40 miles an hour to show you how to pull off a life-saving move. Very fast, fast than expected. When you play with the big boys, sometimes you're gonna get hurt. It felt like hitting a wall. I thought I'd killed him. That's how life has been just this week. I, I've experienced so many things and I'm not here to talk about what I've experienced. I wanna help you get it, get through your own experiences. Life is going to challenge us every time we get together. And the one thing that I'm coming to understand is when we come together, it is number one to thank God for what he's brought us through, but to also thank him for what he's going to see us through. And we've, we've made it to this point. We've survived to this moment, but we still have yet to live. And Bear Grylls said it simply. He said, survival is not about being fearless. It is about making a decision to stay alive long enough to see change if you're still breathing you still have an opportunity to see your life get better I'm not here to sell you on magic potions and, and and ethereal motions I'm here to teach us what the Word of God has simply required of us three things I want to share with you as we prepare for this message for the time that is ours to share I want to speak from the message title a fearless Thanksgiving a fearless Thanksgiving. Three things that you will need in order to endure a fearless Thanksgiving. One is time management. Number one is time management. Most of us don't do well 
with time management. Most of us, time catches us at the worst moments and we are ill prepared for what life dishes out to us. But if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. Somebody already knows. Philippians 4 and 4 simply says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Wait, you mean to tell me life is going to hit me with the best of the worst that it has and I'm supposed to be happy? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what the word of God is telling you. At some point in life, as I've stated, we all need encouragement. The irony is that you rarely need encouragement when life is going well. When you need encouragement the most, it's when life has dished out the worst that it can give you and you are barely surviving. And sometimes those words of encouragement are all you need to keep living and move forward. There are times of discouragement when things go wrong, even when we're trying to do right. I think that's 90% of us most of the time. There are times of uncertainty when we do not know how things are going to turn out. This week, for some of us, it seemed like we went through one thing, we survived that, and four other things came immediately. There are times of stress when the load seems heavier than we are capable of bearing. There are times of fear when our very sense of security is threatened. And usually, during these times of discouragement, uncertainty, stress, and even fear, somebody who knows Jesus is going to come to us and say, you know David encouraged himself. Now, I don't want you to say what you normally would say to that person. I don't want you to say, you shut up, Satan. <laughs> because at those moments, you don't want to hear that. At those moments, something inside of us hears it, understands it, but we can't bear witness with where we are versus where God has placed us and understanding that there's a correlation between the two. Here's what I want you to understand. David encouraged himself, and there's an instance in the Bible that we have to understand that he was at the worst moment of his life. If you have your Bibles, join me in the book of, I don't know what that is, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to read just verse 6 for you. Uh, and, and it says, David was greatly distressed. For the men spoke of stoning him because the souls of them all were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged himself and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now, to give you a little background on what has happened to David in in 1 Samuel chapter 30, they have been off to war, and as they've been off to war, they come back home to Ziglag, and they found that the Amalekites have come in and stolen all of their property. Not only they stolen most of their property, but what was left was burned, their houses, their, their, for us it would be houses and cars, their possessions were burned, and they also kidnapped their wives and children. So when David, the king, returned back, the worshiper returned back, the one who loved God with all his heart came back to a place to live, nothing was there. And while nothing was there, he was with about four, 600, 600 other men. And imagine this, 600 other men want to kill you because you're the leader, because you're responsible. But what did David do? Verse 6 says this, David was greatly distressed for the men spoke of stoning him because of the souls of them all were bitterly grieved for they lost possessions. They lost their things. Their things were taken as well. Their wives and their children were kidnapped as well. But David stood separate from them because of one thing. He encouraged himself. Everything was gone but David encouraged himself. His property was carried away by raiders too, but David encouraged himself. His wife, his children were kidnapped as well, but David encouraged himself. It wasn't time to mourn. It was time to rejoice. Not because your wife and your kids are gone. 
need to clarify that for some people. It wasn't time to call the police. It was time to rejoice. It wasn't time to file a police report or to freak out. It was simply time to rejoice because of this one simple fact. Out of all that the Amalekites came and, take, had, and taken, had taken from David, they took his property. They, they burned the remaining houses and things that they owned. They even kidnapped their wives and children. But of all of that stuff, David still had a relationship with God. And I say to you this day that, that as we're here, that as your week has been the week that it has been, your year, your decade has been the decade or whatever time span you're living in has been the roughest and the worst part of your life that you have said to yourself, it's got to get better than this. I say to you, it can get worse and still get better. And in the, in, in the moments that it gets worse, the one thing you and I have to remember to do is encourage ourselves. What does encourage yourself mean? David could no longer say they have taken I don't, uh, my house. They, he could no longer say my property, my things, my family, but David could still say my God. They could not take God from him. And the one thing, the ladies and gentlemen, that we as believers have to remember is that nobody can take our relationship with God. Nobody can snatch that away from us. Your taxes can be due. Your house can have a lien on it. But nobody can take your relationship with God. And you have to learn to manage your time. When it's time, you, it's not never time to freak out and, and allow life to get the best of you. It's time for you to rejoice. That's the best thing we could do because it confuses not only us, but it confuses the enemy. It confuses the assignment of the enemy. And at the end of the day, you are not here to glorify Satan. You are not here to glorify the devil. You are here to lift up the name of the Lord. And how else do we encourage ourselves but recognize and acknowledge that without God, we are nothing. When preparing for a fearless Thanksgiving, not only must you have proper time management, but you got to realize less is actually more. Sometimes God has taken things from you because you had too much and failed to realize how good he is. When you live a life, and that life is surrounded and your success is determined by what you have, what you've accomplished, what you brought, what you bought, then there's a challenge that has to, that has to be uh, 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 specified. You have to realize that it's not about what you bring to the table. The problem is sometimes we get so much stuff that we forget God. Sometimes. We get so ahead in life that we fall behind on relationship with him. Because the one thing I learned is that when you get stuff, you got to manage stuff. You got to maintain stuff. That stuff gets really expensive over a period of time. And we put so much value on the stuff and, and our effort in maintaining the stuff that God cannot any longer be the source because we have to outsource ourselves and so our time is misconstrued and we don't have time to get before him because the stuff that we have accumulated has taken us away from him. And it has to come to a point. You don't have to lose your stuff. You don't have to let go of your stuff. But you got to put your stuff in proper perspective. Less is actually more. When we, when we moved from a house that we could no longer afford and moved to an apartment, we gave away stuff and we put a value on stuff, well, here's our value. We haven't touched it in six months. I ain't thought about it in a year. Leave it. Let it go. 
We put a value on the stuff, and the stuff came when times were good. We accumulated the stuff when times were good. But when times got rough, you ain't thinking about the stuff. You're thinking about survival. I'm teaching you something here. You got to get beyond what you can control and get to a place where you, you lack control, where God is in control. And that is where, ladies and gentlemen, we as believers have to be. It's not a chaotic life, but it's stepping into the order of God because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So it's not going to line up the way you want it to, but it's going to line up. Less is more. Let your moderations, verse 5, be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand. Moderation, by definition, is the avoidance of excess or extremes. Regardless of your life's goals or your project goals, the less is more philosophy can go a long way in creative value and enabling you to actually progress. As I stated, if you have more stuff, you got to take time to manage more stuff. But less stuff is obviously easier to manage. Today we are focusing on prayer, but this also can be applied to every aspect of our lives. If you can be honest with yourself, raise your heart and not your hand. You got too much stuff. You got stuff you really don't need. You got stuff that in your eyes has lost value. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. And we've held on to stuff that has, that has us bound, but we're not holding on to it. We don't have any connection to it anymore. Here's a way you, you, you can see the less is more. You may not have a large number of hours in a day, but that allows you to focus on prioritizing what is truly important. When we got rid of the stuff, we realized that our family was more important than the stuff ever was. But if I got too much stuff, and I got to maintain the stuff, then I fail to realize how important the small things really are. Like spending time with your family. Like having dinner at the table with no TV. Like tucking your children in the bed, praying over them. But when you got stuff, I got to rip and run and keep moving and because I got to take care of I just want to make sure I'm in the right room. You, you may not have abundance of resources, but less is more. And this means that your passion and purpose may be your greatest asset. If you don't have a whole lot of resources, creativity comes. When I ran out of, I, when I ran out of money, my ideas got stronger. I had to sift through and find out which ones are actually going to work. Because... Can I say this for the record? All your ideas ain't good ideas. If it's a good idea to you, don't mean it's a good idea for everybody else. You may not have countless readers or customers, but this, this means you can focus on providing an exceptional service. You don't have a whole lot of people to interact with, so you can deal with a few people and deal with them according to a quality basis. The less is more concept allows the individual to operate within your own capacity. As a pastor in my field, I have spent years trying to be like other preachers whose churches grew faster than I ever imagined. But when God put me in the position, it didn't happen that way. Whatever your bent in life is, it's going to happen upon, uh, according to your own capacity. You can't model after somebody else and get the same results. You can't do what they did and get better results. What happens for you, what God has for you, is simply for you. The key factor to overcoming fear, the fear of letting go things, the fear of trying new things is to get over the fear that you are inadequate to even do it. 
to get over the fact that you don't have enough or you're not smart enough or you haven't experienced enough to get out of that mentality because you have to become fearless. And here's the key factor. You got to tie in what David dealt with. You can lose it all, but don't lose God. Let your moderation be known to all men. Paul here reaffirms to the believer something that he addressed in both Corinthians and to the Romans. He says in Corinthians 9 and 9 through 23, I'll read it for you. For although I am free in every way from anyone's control, I have made myself a bondservant to everyone so that I might gain the more for Christ. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to the men under the law. I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those without, without outside the law, the law, I became as one without law. Not that I am without the law of God and lawless towards him, but I am especially keeping within a commit, and within and committed to the law of Christ that I might win those who are without the law to the weak, wanting in discernment. I have become weak, wanting in discernment that I might win the weak and overcritical. I have in short become all things to all men that by all means and at all costs and in any and every way save some by winning them to the faith in Jesus Christ. The problem we have with letting go of the stuff is probably because it's the stuff that we built, that we have accumulated, that shows how successful we are. But when we understand this one thing that Paul is sharing with us is that you can lose stuff but not your relationship with God because at the end of the day, you have a whole world of people who are out there accumulating things that have no relationship with God. That if they lose it, they would lose their lives because that is their life. But I become all things to all men. I become weak. I become strong. He said I become curious. He, I became as one with the law. And I knew how to once operate it without the law. I was a little thuggish. But I didn't do it to prove that I can adapt like a chameleon. I did it because the gospel of Jesus Christ is my everything. And what David didn't have, but we have, is the Savior that is Jesus Christ, who has come to redeem us from the lost who has come to redeem us from the curse of the law and bring us into wholeness and fullness in him. Not only did Paul say that, but he said, for the believer who is struggling to be a good believer, who is, who is in Romans chapter 14, verse 21, who is, who is struggling with whether or not I should eat meat, whether or not I should do these rituals because it goes against what I've learned. I don't want to push those away because if it works for them and they're doing it for the Lord, then help me to draw them in. When I'm around them, I won't drink. I know we harp on that and I know Christians drink too. I know you do. I make it a personal choice not to do those things for two reasons. Number one, it will mess up my character. Number one, it will mess up my character. Number two, I don't have an off switch. I don't know how to quit. I don't know how to stop. So it's certain things that I have made a determination not to do, number one, for my own soul salvation, and number two, so, so that I can be an effective witness to somebody else who needs to see Christ. We are exhorted to candor and gentleness and good temper towards our brethren. He said, let your moderation, let your lesser be for all men. In things indifferent, do not run to extremes. As believers, we become so argumentative about the word when the word stands alone. I don't have to throw the scripture down your throat. You read them. 
I'll, I'll point them out to you. If you got questions, I'll answer them. But I'm not going to throw scriptures down your throat because if you don't want to believe, guess what? There's nothing that I can say that will make you believe. I can preach till I'm blue in the face and if you don't say, yes, I believe it, that's where you're going to be until you believe. He said, don't run to extremes. Avoid bigotry and animosity. Don't preach one thing and live another. Don't stand in front of folk, Doug, and preach about holiness and then be hellacious outside of that. Judge charitably concerning one another. In other words, be less critical. Be less argumentative. Be less of our old nature and simply be more like Christ. That's what's going to win the lost. That's what's going to draw them in. Become all things to all men. Understand where people are. The biggest mistake that I made over the years is preaching to you from a preacher's perspective but not understanding your life. Come and trying to get you to understand why I love God so much. I love him because it is my profession to love him. But if you're an electrician, you're not going to love him like I do in the way that I do because I see it from a preacher's perspective. But you got to see that you connect the right thing. You got to see that as an electrician, if you put a faulty wire in with a working wire, something ain't going to work. It's going to cancel out. And that's where we let people see Christ. You don't have to be a preacher to tell somebody about Jesus. You should be a teacher at a high school. You should be a track coach teaching them to run the race. You should be an electrician, a painter, telling them to paint the portrait of your life and it would be nothing. It would have no value without Jesus. But since you're here on a Sunday and I'm a preacher, I'm going to give you the word that should transform your life that you should be able to take back out in your way and spread the gospel. Be more like Christ. When preparing for a fearless Thanksgiving, understand you have to have time management and less is absolutely more. Lastly, you got to know how to go before God and ask a candid request. You know what I've discovered in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6? It simply says these words, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I want you to think about these next words I'm about to say. I'm going to say them, and I'm going to be quiet and let you just think about them. Sometimes we approach God as if he's incapable of answering what we are praying for. God, if it be your will, God, humbly I come before you. When Jesus told us, go boldly before the throne of grace. Go, go boldly. Now, when I'm saying go boldly, I'm not saying you got your list, your, your Christmas wish list, and you want him to fill it. When you go boldly, you're saying that, God, here I am. First off, I'm coming to get me right. I'm coming to make sure that your grace and your mercy does not and has not run out on me. When we go before God, it is for our faith. It is for our salvation. But it said, let your request be made known. He says, be careful for nothing. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. In, in English, they taught us, when you see a sentence that starts with a verb, be careful for nothing, the subject is you. I learned a little bit. He says, you be careful for nothing. That's not a suggestion but a command. The same command that Christ gave to us in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. But if I got to go back to the first point, we spent so much time, we spent so much of our time management 
accumulating our lives and putting our lives together and I want to have a husband by the time I'm 25 with 2.5 kids and a dog and a picket fence and we've time managed our lives to the point that we have get, taken control from God and taken control ourselves. So we spend a majority of our lives time managing our own lives and then somehow, Troy, we find God when it all falls apart. When the husband we prayed and thanked God for asked us for a divorce. When the children we prayed and thanked God for grow up and don't act like the way we raised them. When all of the stuff that made us successful fails, we are left in a place that we have to rely on God. And so it is with that today I am come to talk to survivalists. I am come to talk to people who like Bear Grylls have been put in different situations that the average person cannot survive. But God put you in that place to let you know how much he's thinking about you. I know you feel isolated. I know you feel left alone. I know you're broken. But by the same token, think about it like this. God loved you enough that he put you in it because he knew that there was something inside of you, of you that would survive. I turned Mexican for a second. It's out of you. <laughs> He knew that there was something inside of you that would rise to the top, that would rise to the occasion. Jesus said, take no thought. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body, what you're going to wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in bars, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You might have missed a meal, but I guarantee you made it up. <laughs> your, your money might have fallen short, but I guarantee at some, you can't explain it, but it always came back. And we sit here wringing our hands and worrying about tomorrow and how am I going to make it? My, my computer died one day. The next day my truck died. Lord, my truck, Jesus. <laughs> Not my truck. It don't want to work no more. But you know what I said? God, it served its purpose. It gave me 316,458 miles of good work. And that don't want to work no more because I don't want to put no more money in it. But it served its purpose. And the one thing I realize is, as much as I love my truck, and y'all know I love my truck, it is temporal. It is stuff. It is a thing. And as long as it ain't Jesus and my relationship with God, it can move. I don't have to, have, I'll get up early or walk wherever I got to go until God provide another one. But that's the determination that you're going to have to have in order to survive. You got to stay, it's not about being fearless. It's not about not crying when folk can see you. It is about staying alive long enough to see your life change. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. And my question is, how in the world, I done heard y'all preach to me and say this stuff and I think I shouted and missed a part. So make this clearly make sense. How can I seek the kingdom of God? How can I seek 
his kingdom, and his righteousness. And his answer is very simple. In everything, by prayer and supplication. The Bible simply makes sense. When anything burdens us, when anything has us weighed down, we must find peace in prayer. When our affairs are perplexed and distressed us, we must seek direction through prayer. We must join not only our prayer and our prayer request in thanksgiving, but we must do it in a, in a manner where we honor God, where we thank him, we're honored that he is our God, that in the midst of all of the things that have failed and fallen apart, his word has not failed. I, I, the one thing I, I don't want to do in my life is change the meaning of God in my life. If he was the same yesterday and he's the same today, I don't want to say, God, I need you to change for my tomorrow. If he did it for them yesterday and he's providing for you today, will he not much more take care of your tomorrow? So live and exist in the day. And in essence, when it comes down to having a fearless thanksgiving, there's one thing that you got to do. It's a three-word thing that you have to do, and that is simply trust the process. Trust that God will never leave you. You'll, you'll, you'll leave his presence. You'll, you'll, you'll do things that will cause him to, to, to feel like he's turned his back on you. But he, David said, you'll never leave me nor forsake me. So what, at what part are we, we living our lives with the unconscious mention that God is not there? If I die, you're there. If I live, you're there. If I make my bed in heaven or hell, you are there. So we've got to live with the awareness that God is always with us. That as long as you're living and breathing, his grace and mercy is sufficient for you. And you simply got to trust the process. You got to trust the process. You did not make it this far to fail, to walk away, to say, God, you didn't do it. Because my word says he's not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man. He should have to come back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't. If he said it, he's going to do it. If he spoke it, he's going to bring it to pass. I simply want to give you the word to help you to survive. And that word is, don't quit. Don't quit. Stay in the race. Stay the course. Don't let the worst of life get the best of you. Live. Survive. Father, I honor you. I bless you for who you are. I magnify you for what you're doing and have done. I thank you for your word, your, your life that has been given to us through your son, Jesus. God, my prayer today is that your people are stronger and closer to you day by day. That as we've heard these words, they encourage us to go through these next few days, these next few moments of our lives. To not give up, to not walk away, to not say you've never done, but to God to appreciate what you've always done and look forward to what you will do. And as many have said in a cliche form, I say this, if you never do anything else, you've done enough. And for that, I fearlessly say thank you. To, for that, I fearlessly stand before your people and I give you praise and honor. And I thank you for what you have done. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Redeemer. I can thank you for stuff, but that stuff passes away. But your word is true. Your, your presence is here with us. And we simply want to say thank you. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.